On this episode of the Bi Curian Podcast, Alex Hollingsworth of Crossover Media joined us to talk about Game Stonk, what a short squeeze is, and the bigger issues we face in 2021. Hi, I'm Eric. And I'm Aisla. And together we are the hosts of the Bi Curian Podcast. Bi Curian is our answer to the polarizing culture we live in. Tired of feeling under siege and looking for ways to get involved? Then come be a part of a different way of thinking. Everything from politics to geek culture to current events that polarize us as a society, we explore multiple ways of looking at things. Welcome to the show. We are very excited to be here today with Alex Hollingsworth, our guest. Which we've had on before, um, based on on the fact that he is one of a very select number of successful uh, black VPs in the banking realm and... I was actually quite honored that he approached us to say, hey, do you want to talk about what happened this last week uh, with the game stonk and uh, Robin Hood, as it were? So, Alex, introduce yourself. Hey, thank you guys for having me. I love the show, as always. Um, everybody listening, I'm Alex Hollingsworth. I, I'm a, a black banker, um, and I also run a successful podcast network called Crossover. And so Crossover is an opportunity for us to um, kind of build our own table um, when there's not a seat at the table for us. And so there's 12 different shows on the network and we do a lot of cross promotion and just, and just try to, you know, talk about everything from finance to sports to pop culture. So um, grateful to be here and be able to talk a little bit about money and finance. Yeah. And, and I, I can highly recommend his show. And, and if you haven't listened to the show we've done with him previously, I highly recommend that as well. Ooh. It's all very good work. But what we're here this week to talk about... Well, before we dive into our main topic, yes, because this is important to me, and Eric is indulging me, um, I have a, a little icebreaker, which is, uh, Alex, I'm going to put you on the spot here and ask you to tell us what your definition of bicurian is. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, so it, automatically it sounds like bicurious, right? And mm -hmm. to me, that's, you know, you're, you're curious about it. If, a couple different things and so that's kind of what pops in my head every time i see you guys the show come across my timeline or it comes on my on apple podcast just being curious about a lot of different things i love that it's true and it's, and we do a wide variety of subjects and it is usually whatever kind of catches our fancy so <laughs> definitely appreciate that <laughs> well thank you thank you for for tolerating my um i decided that no one really knows what it means, and so I'd start with asking our guests to, to give, and I will say we've asked four guests, and we've got four different answers, so, and interestingly, I love them all. <laughs> I, I was hoping eventually, like, I was like, maybe this could be market research or something, and uh, Eric's going to love it when I'm like, hey, would you cut these all together for something? <laughs> all right. look, at, look at his face. <laughs> He's excited. <laughs> so we can move on to the real topic, which I'm also super excited about. Well, again, you know, thanks for reaching out to us. I, I, I wouldn't have even had the thought initially. And Isla mentioned that you wrote up and I was like, wow, that would be fantastic because I really do feel like what we witnessed was a little bit of a turning point. And um, you are a banker and um, mm -hmm. I just kind of want to get your thoughts on what, what did we just see in the last two weeks, last month, really? It, it became news a week ago, but... Mm -hmm. We saw a bunch of, you know, they're being called retail traders, just a bunch of regular people who happen to have some stock app, uh, apps, and they were paying attention to which large companies, which large hedge funds were shorting stocks. And when they found out there were a couple of hedge funds that had really large positions uh, and some stocks, they then convinced thousands, if maybe millions of people to go buy that stock. Um, and I know we'll get into it, but that's that's essentially what caused a short squeeze. Um, and so a lot of regular people, you know, figured out, hey, if if the hedge funds and the the traders and all those guys, if they can if they can bet that a stock can fall, well, we can bet that it'll rise. And there's money to be made in doing that. So Well, so I have a couple of questions and this will help, I think, to find some terms because I can guarantee you that a good majority of people probably still do not know <laughs> what a squeeze is, what a short is, what a short sale is, and, and why why this was happening. And, you know, I've read all of the, the, the basics on it, 
and and sure. I think I have a little deeper, but it, you know, essentially, they borrow stocks from someone, which seems like a mystery to me because the concept is they're going to borrow that stock and sell it, yep. mm -hmm. and they hold that cash until that stock falls, and then they buy that many more stocks again, and they give somebody, let's say it's a hundred stocks, like we just play with some numbers here. They they mm -hmm. borrow a hundred stocks, they sell those. When that stock's value falls, they buy it again, and they give somebody back a hundred stocks, and they pocket that difference in money that they basically made on the stock falling. So I think my first question is, who are they borrowing from? So you explained it right. So like I've explained it to a few friends and and I try to keep it as simple as just saying one stock, right? So you're right. Um, let's say I'm a, I'm a shareholder of a company. I own a stock. I own a stock that's worth $10. You are a trader that wants to bet that that stock is going to fall in price. So you and I agree that you borrow the stock, essentially a loan. You borrow the stock from me um, to which you're going to pay interest on that stock to me, whatever whatever they determine, some, some, some amount of interest. So you borrow that $10 stock from me. You're paying interest on it while you have it, but you sell it, right? You sell it at $10. You're betting that that stock is going to fall to, let's say, $7, when it falls to $7, you then buy it again and you give the stock back to the person that you borrowed it from, paying them interest as well, and you pocket the $3 difference. That's what a short is. What a short squeeze is, is when you bet that a stock is going to fall. So again, you borrow one stock for $10, you sell it at 10, you bet it's going to fall to seven. Well, when the stock doesn't fall to seven, when the stock rises, let's say the stock rises to $20. Well, what's happening is someone is buying that stock or there's some event has happened to cause that stock to rise. Typically, you know, it might be a, a new product launch or quarterly dividends that exceeded previous expectations. Those are normal things that might cause a stock to rise. Um, in this case, a bunch of other investors bought stock. So when you buy the stock, the price starts to go up, right? Well, if you're betting that the stock is, that you're trying to short the stock, if you're the person that borrowed it, sold it, you're waiting for it to drop to seven, now all of a sudden that $10 stock goes up to $15, $20. You're trying to figure out why. So all these, you know, all these people are buying that stock, forcing it to go up. The squeeze happens when the person who was betting that the stock would fall now needs to cover their position and they start buying the stock at the higher price, so more than $10. So a bunch of regular people force the stock to go up. The person that was shorting it now needs to cover their losses, so they start buying it, which in essence forces it to go even higher. That is a short squeeze. I hope I explained it clear. No, I, I absolutely. I, I think you did. Well, and I, I've stayed as out of this as you can. My my curiosity, and I'll we'll get to that later, is sort of the the – so the social justice perspective of the mm -hmm. regular people having found a, a moment of power here. Well, because let's clarify something just just so it's clear to the listeners as we go forward. The guy in that story that bought that stock and was planning on pocketing that difference is a massive hedge fund with billions of dollars, basically, right. well, and blank checks to do this sort of thing to make more money. Well, and, if there was an enemy of yeah. <laughs> the people on Wall Street, we are talking about these hedge funds. This is how they actually make money on the back of the failure of businesses and the little guy. And and sometimes drive it, as I understand. Um, but what I heard you say, too, was that in some ways covering your position is really another way of saying, my loan is due. I, you know, I borrowed it and my loan is now due. Mm -hmm. I have to give it back and I don't have it. <laughs> so I got to figure that out. Right. And to and, buy it now costs me $20. And there, and the increase right. in price, essentially the, the money that the rest of the folks are making is the money the hedge fund has to put back into the economy rather than into their coffers or the, and, you know, but get, because the, as it goes up, because they're buying and those other people can, if they feel like sell, of course, it'll drop it differently and, but recoup some of that. I don't know. That doesn't seem bad to me. Um, is it bad? I mean, I see so many like different. My, I've read some on the GameStop, but you know, in that like there was a the guy who was doing it was actually investing, and GameStop did meet their video console delivery. Like 
they mm -hmm. they aren't necessarily dead in the water um and unless but it seems like the hedge fund was kind of pushing them that way based on what i was reading but i'm like i said still very peripheral so i'd love your opinion it's more important yeah, so <laughs> so you you borrow that stock at ten dollars mm -hmm. and you've bet that it's gonna fall to some dollar amount right when it starts to go up you have to ask yourself a question as the hedge fund we, we so we already owe this we we owe someone else ten dollars because we borrowed their stock not only do we owe them ten dollars we owe them interest for however long we're going to hold that stock, right? So a week, a month, however long, you're paying interest on that. <clears throat> then what happens is when it goes up, you have to ask yourself, wait, now it's up to $15. So now not only do I owe the, the stockholder $10 plus interest, in order for me to even get that stock back, I've got to spend $15 to get it. So now I'm in a whole $25 plus interest. What they're trying to do is figure out if we can get how many of these stocks do now do we now need to buy to cover the short that didn't actually happen right when the regular investors buy it makes it go up right but it takes you know thousands or millions of regular investors to make a stock go up when a hedge fund has to come in and spend a few billion to make up the money that they shorted now that same stock skyrockets and that's, so you get kind of like, it's like a, a you know, on a gerbil on a wheel, mm -hmm. like now you're just going in circles and the stock keeps going up. So with GameStop, you know, I had people texting me saying, wait, is it because of like the PS5 and like the consoles that are coming out? And I said, it has nothing to do with that. Those consoles came out over a month ago. Like if anything, you might see a raise in, in Sony stock or Microsoft stock it has nothing to do with all the new consoles that are coming out. Mm -hmm. So shorting a stock isn't bad. Um, betting against the short as regular uh, retail uh, uh, stock buyers did, that's not bad either. It's all about being able to cover your position. Mm -hmm. And if you're someone like in this case, Melvin Capital, that you know they're the hedge fund that took the biggest loss out of all these hedge funds. I think when this started, they had like 13 billion in investments. And when it was all said and done, they had like eight billion in investments because they had lost a good portion of what they owed, you know, what they owned originally. Um, now they needed a bailout from Citadel. Citadel's another larger yeah. bank, like one of the too big to fail banks. Right, and then you get into the Robinhood aspect of it, where Citadel is a client of Robinhood, and Robinhood started freezing trading, and now regular people start to ask, "Well, wait a minute, how is this possible?" Like we, one. Markets aren't supposed. You, you know, ten to four o'clock, you're allowed to trade stocks. Now, there's post trading and you know after hours trading that goes on that regular people can't participate in that the hedge funds and the big banks do. Um, but throughout the business day, no one there shouldn't be an app out there that just says we're going to stop trading for whatever. You know, if systems fail and all of that, I understand. But but arbitrarily freezing the market. Um. Yeah, somebody you're, made you're a gonna... decision on that. <laughs> like that wasn't yeah. an accident. I mean, that's a that's whether a they crazy had to to cover their to their 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 own. Like, I mean, there's talk that they didn't have enough money to cover what the trades right. that were being done. It has to go through a clearinghouse. Robinhood's not actually handling the money; they're pushing it to a clearinghouse. They couldn't push that much. I mean, they needed a supposedly a billion dollar bailout to even start trading again on Monday. So, um, before we get into that further, though, I do want to touch sure. on one thing. Isn't short selling, shorting stocks like this, isn't it illegal because basically it caused the 2008 market crash and years of recovery from that? And the banks that were too big to fail were, were basically shorting um, stocks and, uh, and this is a key thing, why it, why it affected the housing market, but mortgages as well. I'm not, well, I don't think it's illegal now. So, you know, in response to the market crashing back in 08, there's legislation that was put in, like the Dodd-Frank was put in. A lot of that was rolled back when Trump was in office. So, you know, uh, shorting stock, you know, as far as I know, is not is not illegal. And I'm not sure if that's because some of the things that he specifically rolled back or if that's just, you know, shorting stock's been around for a long time. Yeah. Um, Does it? But oh, oh, sorry. I was going to say, sure. like, if because I was listening to you and, you know, you're saying like when they have to buy to cover their position, it causes the stock to go up. If they buy huge amounts to short, but a set, if they borrow huge amounts to short and sell it, 
does that cause it to to drop? Like, is the the act of that level of shorting likely to affect it to go down? I mean, I think that it can. Look, let's say, for example, Warren Buffett decides to buy a large amount of shares in an airline. Everyone knows who Warren Buffett is. When he does that, makes that decision, that's going to drive stocks up, mm -hmm. right? Like, he's Warren Buffett. The same thing would happen if Warren Buffett said, I'm going to sell 10 million shares of an airline. That's going to cause a lot of other people to sell their shares because they're going to now believe, what does Warren know that we don't know, right? So the same thing goes with these hedge funds. If they're if they're dumping large amounts of stock uh, to sh short, that in theory can make the stock drop as well. Um, I, I think the question is, this, so for example, like GameStop, you know, that's a, that's a, a stock that uh, these hedge funds had, had a, a short set up. Well, then the question is how many people were actually paying attention to the stocks that they're trying to short anyway, right? Like GameStop was one, AMC was another, uh, BlackBerry. They are companies that a lot of people probably already think are on their way out the door. Like no one thinks about BlackBerry anymore. Movie theaters are dead in the water at this point. So it was, anything brick and mortar is, is 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 in a lot of ways the way of the past. And so I don't know, but I believe that it has an impact on those stocks, yes. How much of an impact, I'm not 100% sure. Um, let's say, for example, it was um, like Tesla's through the roof these days. Mm -hmm. If someone shorts Tesla, everyone's going to pay attention to why Tesla or Amazon or, you know, companies that are just always, that's just doing really, or Apple as an example. Um I just don't know. I can't quantify yet how much it's, these shorts actually make the stock drop. Yeah. Well, that um, leads I haven't into dug that deep into it. Yeah. Well, that leads into kind of another aspect here, um, which is Reddit subgroup Wall Street bets, and um, I think I I think the way that I actually kind of caught on that uh, that this was happening on that Reddit sub you know group. Uh, was because of an Elon Musk post. And for anyone not aware of a little bit of history there, uh, Elon hates that his Tesla stock has been shorted numerous times over the last several years. And so if they're wondering where his dog in this hunt got involved, I think he loved the idea yeah. of the little guys <laughs> getting somebody back uh, because his own stock has been, like you, you just mentioned, uh, shorted a mm -hmm. few times. But um, let's talk about Wall Street bets. So... Um, if you're not aware, they basically get on there and talk a lot about stocks. And there's been some good things. Um, they had a few years ago, they did a short squeeze on Volkswagen um, that was shorted and going to go down. And, and they were a much smaller group of people, but they were able to manage mm -hmm. to pump that stock up against the short. And again, most people cleared quite a bit of money by the time uh, everything was done. So I saw numerous, but before... It got flooded with another 4 million people on there. I saw numerous comparisons to this. But here's one quick question. If um, I know the two that for sure were shorted, in theory, um, was GameStop and AMC. How did, I, other than nostalgia, I've seen that blamed on this, how did all of those other stocks that were like nostalgia brands for 40-year-olds, like Bed Bath & Beyond and... Yeah, and and BlackBerry and all of that get lumped in. Were they shorted on their positions too? I haven't even seen confirmation on that. Um, so you know, I am not clear on how those other ones got lumped in. So I, you know, I was following this pretty closely when it when it first spiked, and um, there were several things going on. One, there were people saying, you know, just by GameStop, like everyone focused on GameStop, and then AMC popped up, Best Buy. Uh, build a bear and to some point uh what ended up happening was if everyone's focusing on gamestop then that's great for whoever figured out that they could squeeze the short right whatever whoever in, in, in that subreddit figured that out but now all of a sudden there's four or five other stocks that people are bringing up so now as a retail investor you're making a decision well how much am i going to put in gamestop or am I going to put anything into GameStop stock or am I going to put my money into these four others? It starts to divide the community. And I saw a lot of that going on with folks who are part of that group. Um, I'm not sure if I, I, I'm not sure if those stocks were being shorted. Someone, when I was following it in the Reddit, someone kept bringing it up. You know, also these, these four stocks are next. These five stocks, uh, stocks are next. And I don't know what was behind that. 
like GameStop, everyone knew Melvin Capital had a big short. I mean, that was really evident. The other ones, I'm not sure what hedge funds or what other players were involved that that someone said, wait, this this hedge fund has a big short with AMC. Let's let's see if we can squeeze that. Right. A um, name because the other helped, ones didn't right? spike. <laughs> like somebody's a name of a company that had that short interest, right? So. Right. <laughs> and I mean, you and you mentioned Elon Musk. I mean, he started tweeting by Dodge by by Dodge Coin, and I think he was he was tweeting a lot about um, a GameStop as well. So when someone like him starts to pay attention, then you know he tweets about it. Then everyone on social media is paying attention. Yeah. And so to some degree, so the question you asked earlier about is short selling in itself manipulating a stock. And then the question is also when someone like Musk goes on a social media platform and says, buy this stock, is that doing the same exact thing? And we're in a, we are in a, a, a interesting place with all of this um, because to some degree he fueled some of this, right? Like his platform is massive mm-hmm. and he kind of co-signed it yeah. and he had his own reasoning. Like, like you said, his company gets shorted. So he doesn't like that. So it was his way of getting back at these other billionaires, but there seemed to be a lot of manipulation going around. Um, and only so many people can make money. Like everybody's just not going to make money in that situation. So, but a lot of, you know, retail investors did, but I think there was manipulation. Like I hate saying on both sides because on a lot of topics, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in the whole both sides thing, but I think Melvin, Melvin got what they had coming. Like there's just so much data out there now that there's someone looking to beat you. Yeah, Whether you would assume they probably tried like, to do this on the down low, right? Like they they don't want this to make the right. news, and 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 they're not exactly going and doing press releases on their short position right. on on something. So I, I'm sure they were upset that this made the news, and and it did well, mostly because people probably looked at GameStop one day and said, "How did this go from twenty dollars to four hundred and eighty dollars?" Yeah, in there was no days. logical reason for it. Yeah. Right, there was just no reason. I mean there was just no reason for it to trade like that, especially that quickly. Um, and you're right. Like, you know, I, I thought to myself, like how often have I paid attention to short sales? Like I had to really think about it because even I don't pay much attention to it and I've been in banking for a long time. So I'm sure many people don't, but once it became like once Reddit picked up on it, that was one thing. Right. But then like for a week, CNN, Wall Street Journal, MSNBC, every major news platform was talking about this, which drove more speculation and probably made more people go and buy it. So it was, it was just, it was like a once in a lifetime thing. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know if I believe that like anyone's going to come in and try to regulate this. Cause I don't think, I don't think you can personally, but I, I guess I could be, you know, I'm sure they can come up with something. Well, but was gonna, one of the things yeah. I wanted to, this was one of the comments that I felt summed it up the best, which was, it was on the Reddit thread. So you probably saw it, but Remember when senators got coronavirus briefings before the public and sold off millions of dollars in stocks before the crash last year and faced no consequences and no regulation? Then Reddit made one stock into a meme, and they're talking about restructuring the whole market. And and that, to me, like, it's another place where I do feel like Jon Stewart made a comment similarly where he was just like, you know, these guys are just playing your game. Like get off it (laughs) like like the the normal people and you know there's a lot of questions obviously about you know robin hood there's a lot of questions about you know the platform elon musk has and you know the possibilities of people being manipulated individually however the hedge funds are just kind of used to having the power to do the things the way they want to do it without any consequences Mm -hmm. and i super love that they had a five billion dollar consequence because I'm so tired of it. I am so tired of seeing someone get arrested and put in prison for years because of something like a drug charge or they didn't do anything right. wrong or die, as we mm-hmm. saw over the summer. And then wealthy people are convicted of damaging our entire market. Mm-hmm. And they get, they're fine. They're fine. <laughs> they go to, they go to they prison just- for five minutes and then they get a lawyer to you know, get them off. And I love that we have a justice system, but it's not working for them because they're getting away with things that are horrible. And it's really great to see someone have to have a consequence. They got beat at their own game. Yeah. Like, and, and, and <laughs> the, the stock market, the stock market is nothing more than a casino. 
Yeah. That's exactly what the stock market is, right? And um, I think people don't get that, especially for a retail investor, you know. <laughs> right. If you I mean, if you're if you, you're the little guy with a Robin Hood as your app and and even 10 grand or even 100 grand, you, mm -hmm. you are such a small player, you are betting against the house and you are playing in a casino. You can you can do well um and you can read all the reports and try to make educated decisions. I it, but they got beat at their own game. And that happens sometimes for them. It doesn't happen often. Right. So it was like a, a shock to the system. Right. Like, mm -hmm. like it was like a brain freeze. Like you eat too much ice cream and all of a sudden you have a brain freeze. Like that's what it was for them. And rather than, rather than them just say, you know what? I lost today. So be it. You know, then they want to run to the federal government and say, well, you guys need to step in. Well, that's not like, I don't, I don't see, no one has showed me how something was done illegally by the Redditors or anyone on social media. Right. Like, they figured something, they got some information. They convinced enough people to buy into that information and yeah, pay they, attention. They shared the information. You won. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and so, you know, hedge funds. So to your point about, you know, Congress people and senators that knew about the coronavirus. And so like, I believe, I believe one of them was Kelly Loeffler, Loeffler, the, the lady that lost down in Georgia, I think mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm a big believer in once you take a public office, all of your stocks, everything should go into a trust and you should not be able to allow to trade while you're in public office. Yeah, period. blind trust. And you should be completely out of the right. system because you're too integrated into it. Agreed. It, it shouldn't be allowed. But, you know, this country has more than one flaw and that, that tends to be <laughs> one of them. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so they got beat at their own game. And I don't I don't feel sorry for. Like if you can if you can lose eight billion or five billion and still be OK, like I I, I don't. Am I supposed to feel sorry for you? Right. <laughs> like that's crazy talk. I I don't. Um, you got beat, and sometimes like sometimes I don't know if I can curse on here, but sometimes yes. like <laughs> you can. You know, we, just, we're explicit now. <laughs> it, there's a, a scene in the movie Friday where the you know the son wants to use a gun to to beat a bully, and his father says, "Back in my day, you know, you you took your ass whipping and then you went home, and that was it. No one died." Well, hedge funds. You take your ass whipping and you go back on home. Yeah. Like that's just, that's how this thing works. So. Well, and I want to call out, you know, again, we, we're, we're recording this show and we're going to release it right away. It's not always how we do it, but this is going to change dramatically. I think if we tried to release it next week, but you know, another concerning thing that I want to call out is that Janet Yellen recently appointed treasury secretary has said, she's going to look into this and has refused to recuse herself after taking $870,000 mm -hmm. from Citadel last year you know i mean after a point we got to actually pay attention to like the people in charge of enforcing these laws have conflicts of interest and it's a problem so one thing that that i dislike about this country is it costs so much money to run for public office especially federal public offices and most people don't have that kind of money so well how do you get it well you're, you're basically taking loans or borrowing money from businesses, like huge corporations that donate to your campaigns and all that stuff. And then the question is, are you beholden to your, your donors, right? These large, these large companies. And in a lot of cases they are. And so I'm always, I'm of the belief that when there's any sense of, of a conflict of interest, then you need to recuse yourself. Like that's just how this thing should go. But if she recuses herself, I mean, who who do you believe is going to step in that doesn't also have a conflict of interest? Well, that's the thing, right? Like, right. ultimately, in order to get there, like you said, you have to probably cross yourself a few times. And I will say when it comes to money and finance like this, this is the one area where uh, we're pretty much screwed in a very bipartisan way. There's <laughs> nobody clean to look at this stuff. Well, that's the thing, though. What What if everybody who is connected to the players had to recuse themselves and we had to actually find someone who was not <laughs> and also competent it might take a little longer i believe they exist i don't think only the corrupt are qualified but the problem is they're the easiest people to find because they have the biggest megaphone and they have the highest level platform and and it's really about like if we actually want to have a democracy, we have to democratize the process. And that means that people in positions of power have to have the ethics to recognize when they are compromised. And we just don't we don't have that level of integrity in our officials. We don't have that level of integrity in a general sense. 
and it's it's screwing us in a major way like not just financially but but the i would say the inequities of capitalism are a huge part of why the other inequities are so massively amplified and i'm just like yeah i agree yes it would take forever to find someone else why not just say we won't compromise we want that even in a couple places <laughs> can we just do it like once or twice a year <laughs> It'd be nice, know. right? Right. Like, just I'm not saying everywhere. I'm not all about being ideologically pure. I get that you have to make compromises and life has to go forward, but just once or twice a year, could we pick something and just be like, no, no, we're not tolerating it this time? I mean, I, there you go. That's and, my, well, that's my, what is it called? Platform for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Rant. I, I don't think, you know, I, I don't think that they're going to be able to do anything about retail investors like buying stock i mean i and in doing what just happened the information is public right like stock it, hedge funds have to disclose who they where they buy their stock and and their balance sheets and all those things and so how do you stop thousands of people from deciding one day we're going to all go buy the same stock and unless you put minimum thresholds mm -hmm. but even that you, you can't do that so i think that they're i, I think that the government is saying we're going to look into this and that's just their way of trying to make it seem like they're going to, I don't, I don't think anything happens. Well, the, so here's another point. And you said something earlier um, and it was interesting to me because the SEC can find something probably if they want to. And I've heard tale that they're going to go and investigate who the players might've been that riled up wall street Ooh. bets and hold them accountable for basically, I mean, I don't even know if is it market manipulation to tell a million people to buy a stock. Well, I, I think it could be actually. So well, but well, what you said about because um, you it, am I outing you? I'm outing you. You were in there looking at things to buy, and well, I've been a Robinhood user. And I'll, I'll be clear on that. I, I yeah. play with like five hundred dollars. I'm not a big player, but, but, but you, you the, look for your opportunities. And and I had heard about this. I didn't. But after the GameStop thing, there was like something about silver, and then there was this question of yeah. like, was that the hedge fund? And so the supposedly what the Congress people have asked Yellen to look into is is not so much what happened to the hedge fund but what happened to the retail investors the the behavior of robin hood the freeze mm -hmm. of assets and then some of these right. like questionable suggestions that didn't fit the pattern like are were, were those like trolls and bots that the rich hedge funds were like we can we can fix this you know mm -hmm. so one will they look into it would yell and actually oversee it effectively you know and what could they you're right like what could they do i don't know yeah, I, look, I mean, you know, Robinhood stopped letting people trade for a while. And I mean, to me, if they're looking into that and that was done maliciously, you know, then they could find a clear path on how that happened and, and why it happened and, and fine or punish, put in jail, whoever made that decision. Um, I think if anything, here's what one of the things that needs to happen is a site like there are a lot of sites out there. You know, we were talking offline about the different platforms that we use like they're trading stock and buying e trade still a thing things. there's there's yeah, schwab there's a lot you, you can you can right. sign up for these retail investment things through a lot of avenues robin hood's kind of the new hip techie one but robin hood made it easy with their app and like you know it's no minimums and all this kind of stuff and it opened a door to a lot of people that probably don't really pay attention to stocks anyway but it was easy plus they had this thing where i think they were giving away a free stock if you signed up or something um these days and so they made themselves attractive what probably needed to happen was, and I hope that it will going forward, Robin Hood and any other place needs to have enough money to cover their losses. Like, so if Robin Hood stops stocks from being traded because all of a sudden they realized they didn't have enough to cover everything, that's a problem, right? Like that's a legitimate issue that a trading platform has a Robin Hood probably has millions of customers at this point, and they couldn't cover all these trades coming back and forth. That's an issue. So I, I don't think anything happens. Like I said, I don't think anything happens to the retail investors. I think that there's going to probably be a deep dive into what happened with Robin Hood and who, who influenced and who made what decision. Then out of that, what ends up happening is like with Yellen, how far would she be willing to punish because there are conflicts of interest? That's the next question. And um, I don't know how far she would be willing to go. Uh, you know, I don't, you know, she's new in her role. I don't know yet. I'm just sure she wasn't um, expecting this. And the short list of things that have happened no. in 2021 that have been really crazy, we'll add this to well, it. <laughs> and, and you know, and 
and to be fair, in my opinion, what happened with GameStop is minuscule compared to what's happening with the coronavirus and cops killing black people and people being laid off because this thing has lasted like a year and it's just it, and the foolishness that Trump brought on. There's like bigger things to me than figuring out how did a bunch of retail investors figure out how to short squeeze a hedge fund. Like I, I, that would not be the top of my list, but I'm not an elected official, so I don't get to make those decisions. Look, let me say, I completely agree with you. Um, in fact, I think part of this is actually probably relatable to boredom. I don't, I don't think it's um, coincidence that this sort of thing is happening post holidays. Um, people may or may not have done some dumb things around like the holidays with, with not being careful around COVID. But in general, a lot of people were at home. I mean, one of the recurring themes I saw uh, in, in the Wall Street bets was that people, these people were bored. <laughs> you know, the, some of the main investors are out of work line cooks and, and things like that on Wall Street bets. So um, to pay attention to the stock market, the way that, that the way GameStop was moving this la the last few days, you've got to be glued to your screen. And, you know, if you're at your job, typically you couldn't be glued to your screen the way. It, so, yeah, I think people being home played a huge role and people having a lot of free time to pay attention. Yeah. And some some folks won. Yeah. And that make that I mean, I can't unequivocally be, say it was, you know, because I get that there were there were losses for regular people. I don't care about the corporations and hedge funds that I care about the regular people who were scared and hopeful and maybe dove into something with some pie in the sky ideas mm -hmm. that didn't work out for them and couldn't afford to lose. I, I did appreciate reading through the Reddit thread that they, the most of the people were consistently saying, please take the money you can afford to lose. Like don't, yeah. don't take your, your rent money. Don't take your kids college funds. And I'm sure some people ignored that. And so, you know, and, and people get to make those choices and take those risks. But I, I feel for that. And I also am really glad that a bunch of regular people, like you were telling a story of a guy who put in 50 grand and made something like an $11 million. Like mm -hmm. that makes me so happy that there's some folks out there who are going to get to like try, try something different. Maybe they'll be better about putting that money back into the community, you know, cause like you said, how much money do you need? <laughs> like, you know, there were, I, I read a lot of posts with people saying, you know, they someone in the family needed an operation they just they quickly made enough to get the operation done and they pulled out other people saying they had to pay that this was money that they wanted to pay rent that was you know back uh past due mm -hmm. yeah there are a lot of people, people i think that just regular people did yeah. you know yeah one guy was saying he, he 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 made enough to pay the taxes on what he made uh pay off his fifty five thousand dollars student loan and put mm -hmm. like ten or fifteen thousand dollars on a house like like he basically just became someone who came of age in the fifties when things were manageable. <laughs> by, mm -hmm. And, you know, and to me that was like, I was like, what a great equalizer. I I'd love to see that kind of equalizing happen again more often. Well, one thing that I do hope that everybody who, you know, retail investors that, that made significant money in this, this thing, I hope that they pay attention to capital gains and yes. that they know that they set some money aside because I don't, I don't know if a lot of people understand how capital gains works. And when you, you all of a sudden make 40 or $50,000 in a weekend because the stock skyrocketed, you go out and you spend all that money, whether it's on, you know, bills you have, or it's on a new car, you're going to owe the IRS some money at the end of the year. Yep. Um, because uncle Sam, you know, well, I can't say what I want to say. But, <laughs> well, and, and for anyone listening that might not know about this, capital gains are roughly 30 to 40 percent of any free and clear money above your initial investment. So just be aware. Only if will... you're poor, don't leave it in for a year and don't get it as a stock gift from your company. Then it gets to be lower. Yeah, there's a lot of loopholes, but anyone who made money right. on this one is going to owe 30 to 40 percent on any gains they made. Just be aware. And, there, you know, a lot of people, they use, you know, online platforms to file their own taxes and things like that. Like, you know, me and my wife, we have a CPA because we own businesses and stuff. So we, yeah. you know, we, we need someone to do our stuff. But like, if you're, when, before we had these companies and I used to just do ours online, like, I don't know if I would have known if I hadn't been in the finance industry about capital gains. And so I do hope that whoever listens that if, if you got lucky and you made some money out of this thing, Talk to a CPA and make sure that you're setting aside money for your capital gains um, yeah. if you pull that money out. So, 
That's I'm going to add one, uh, one other lesson. Please do not expect this to happen again. I promise it's not going to be the next big short squeeze next week. <laughs> and if you hear it's somebody well, say that it's happening, do a lot of research before you start pulling money out and, and putting it in there. It's happened a couple times. I just I don't know if anyone can forecast when it will happen. Like, and when it does, it comes out of the blue, yeah. and it's just it's it's a casino. Yeah. You know, it's just <laughs> yeah. You you could lose. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and the house it is in the house's favor. <laughs> yeah, so, definitely. Um, before we close, I, I is there anything particularly exciting that you want to share, or any final thoughts about this topic or finance in general? I, I like you brought up a bunch of other things that are more important. So if you got anything on that too, <laughs> we're happy to hear that as well. <laughs> well, one, I'm I'm happy that people are paying attention to the stock market, like regular everyday people. Like I think we need more of that. Um, and so it's, it's, that's one good thing. Like all this attention that GameStop got, I think that there are probably millions of people out there now all of a sudden paying attention to the stock market. So that part is good. Um, and just in terms of all the other stuff, I mean, I, I was saying this morning to my wife, I really don't know how long this COVID environment is going to last. Like it feels like, so when this, this all happened last March, you know, my, my co-host of off the record, we were sitting at one of my co-host apartments and I said, this is going to get bad. And they were all, they laughed at me like, and they've admitted to it on like on the record. Like we didn't think we didn't believe him. We thought he was being paranoid. And I was like, look at who is in office and what needs to like, I said, do you think that, that he has the, the mental fortitude to do what needs to be done? And if he does, how do you think Americans going to respond? Because Americans, in my opinion, are the most hard headed people on the planet. You tell an American to do one thing, they want to do the other thing. You can't tell me what to do. I'm protected by this law. I got this. I, I'm an American, blah, blah, blah. The country should have shut down last year. And I mean a hard shutdown to try to get in front of this, but it didn't. And now here we are with four new strains. And I just saw the CDC on CNN earlier saying the UK strain is not only uh, more easy or easily spread, but it is more dangerous than we originally thought. It's more lethal than we originally thought. And it's just like the longer any of these strains stay out and just out and about, the more chances there are to mutate. And like I said a little while ago, there's just there's so many more, so much more important things that that needs to take place. Um, we talked about, you know, we talked about like Congress people knowing about certain companies and selling their stock before the public knows. Like, so here in Maryland, I pay close attention to when Maryland is kind of um, locked down and shut down and when they reopened and every time Maryland reopens, it's because of a holiday and it's, and you know, it's sold as things are better. Cases are down. We're going to reopen. Well, in my opinion, we were opening because it's a holiday and we want people to spend money and travel and all this stuff. And so I, we're just, we're leadership and I, and then citizens, I think, like we're just everybody's doing the, doing a disservice to themselves. So I want Congress to get this fixed. I want Congress to make sure that people like me stop getting killed by cops. Like those are way more important to me. Um, you know, I think Marjorie Green was just kicked off a couple committees today. Yep, she was that, stripped uh, of all of her assignments. I, I saw the news right before you called in. Yeah, I mean, it. She needs to be out of Congress. Period. Like yeah. you, you can't. Strip the committees is one thing, and I think that should have happened. But like, you can't have people spreading rumors and racist stuff and saying things, you know, shootings were fake. And she needs those people have no right to be in office. And so I, I think that there are just greater, greater threats on democracy than say a bunch of people on a subreddit trading stock. <laughs> like, well, just and look, I can only imagine how this affected you because I'm still affected by seeing thousands of unabashed white supremacist white nationalist gop card carrying trump supporting yeah. republicans take over the capitol building and i i don't think there's a there's a part of me that cannot rest until a piper is paid on that and some but i mean you know i i, I i'm about to make that my crusade and like i said i can only imagine how you feel about it because that's how i feel about it as a white man yeah we were you know so my wife when she was younger she's worked at the capitol building um, I've got several family members. I'm not allowed to say what they do, but I have several family members that work at the Capitol. One was in there and couldn't get out when it was being stormed. One of my family members, black guy. 
And so for me to watch a white mob storm a building that, like I said to my wife, I didn't even know you could just go into the Capitol. And she said, you could, you, you're not supposed you to, like, can't. you're not allowed. No, right. like, <laughs> that's not allowed. Like, <laughs> I've been, I've been to Black Lives Matter on protests in DC and the amount of police around for that versus the amount of police that was available for the Capitol siege, it's crazy. And um, to see a lot of these people getting bond and be able to walk walk back home or go back home, like, nah, I, I've always said that, um, you know, this this country this country certainly people saying that this country is divided now, like there's a division now, like where the hell have you? I'm, I'm 39 years old, like where the hell have you been the last 39 years? Yeah, like this country is not this big like melting pot that we all learned in school. It doesn't work that way. Um, and you got to see right there on every major news outlet how the country treats one group of people versus the other group. And one group was breaking the law and officers died and all this Blue Lives Matter stuff that I thought they cared about, clearly they don't care about. Um, and so I've always grown up with knowing there's a double standard in this country. I don't have a choice but to accept it. Like when, when people say like, for example, Clemson's head coach Dabo Sweeney, who I think at one point he said, if you don't like this country, you can leave. Well, like, I don't have anywhere else to go. Like, you know, you could say I can go back to Africa, but like, no, not only did you bring my people here, my ancestors, you also stripped Africa of all its natural natural resources as well. So we wanted to get up and go back to Africa. What is there for us to go back to that you guys haven't already taken? And so I don't, this country is just a huge double standard. Yeah. And yeah. I don't see how anyone could say otherwise. I completely agree. And I can tell you that, you know, that deep down, I know, that when I saw what happened on January 6th, there was a commitment that just like fell into place in my mind. I'm going to be taking that apart on this show for the rest of this year and as long as it takes um, because it's just wrong. And and we let this country get out of hand, uh, you know, f for everyone and especially for black and brown people, uh, any minority group or whatever. Like that is not who we say we want to be as a country supposedly and we're going to have to do a lot of work and and i'm going to be doing a lot my social justice work hasn't changed if anything i feel more just discouraged that it's gotten as bad as it has but i'm going to be doing it and i know you probably will too yeah i what? thought you know for me i i thought a wake-up call came for the country or would come when the young lady was killed in charlottesville by that white supremacist that ran ran over her yeah i said to myself i said to my wife i was like wait a minute a white supremacist killed a white woman. Yep. White people have to wake up to that, right? Like they might not wake up to someone that looks like me getting killed, but like that should wake you up. And it didn't. And three years later, you've got a bunch of them storming the Capitol saying the election is fake. And they want to instate Trump as like some kind of supreme leader. And look, I think it could happen again because law enforcement, the military, Congress, the president, did not send a message when that siege happened. No. If you don't send a message when it happens, it's going to happen again. A, a couple hundred people I, going to jail because some dude was easily recognized with the horns on his head is not going to send a message. Right. No, well, I, and they're I, not going to, I don't think they're going to convict. I thought they might, but, I, and if they don't convict him, then all they're doing Trump, Trump, is, you mean? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> they're not going to convict Trump. But I don't think so. And, and I hate, I hate putting that out there like that because I feel like, you know, you should hope for justice, but I just don't. And the the amount of doublespeak and and backhanded BS that I've heard from congressional leaders and and people, some people I honestly respected before this, who, you know, they they are just making excuses, and they're calling for unity. It's like no 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 no. You don't call for unity. If someone punches me in the face and then is like, let's be friends, I'm going to be like, wait a minute. <laughs> you got to deal with that. And was right. like, if you can't see it when they stormed the Capitol, you person who bases yourself in patriotism, I, I don't know that you're ever going to see it. Like the discouragement that I feel around that, I, I would have expected, like you said, the Charlottesville thing, just honestly, not the white woman dying, the fact that they were marching with torches and KKK things and anti-semitic symbols i was like i mean that was three years ago and that was proof that we ha now live in a world where at some point in the last 10 years people were no longer afraid to be called a white supremacist which used to actually mean something to <laughs> an extent 
They'd get offended. And Trump was like, there's good people there. I'm like, no, right. no, you can't say that because that's not the message. I mean, from, from like the 70s on into the 2000s, the KKK people at least hid their robes in their closet and did their meetings inside with no windows. I mean, and we got pretty bad for that to not be happening right now. Yeah, like that's the... I mean, so if those things... I don't know. I'm discouraged. So, and I'm sure you're, I'm not alone, but anyhow. <laughs> I One thing that I think with about Donald Trump is I, I expect politicians to kind of protect each other, like protect their own. So one, Trump isn't really a politician. Like he's not, he's not this lifelong politician. He's not one of them, which is it to me, the fact that they're willing to let him get off on all these things is crazy because he's not really a politician. The second part of this is so much of his base is quote unquote middle America and Southern America and, you know, working class whites or, or poor white people. And I think to myself some days, you realize he's a Manhattanite, right? Like he wouldn't piss on you if you were on fire. Yeah. But you realize that he's not really one of you. So he's not out there working in coal mines. He's not out there tilling the land. He is not one of you. Yet you're willing to, to storm the Capitol and go to jail over this man who he was a Democrat just, what, a decade ago? He, yeah. he, he flips based on whatever he needs to get done. He and said he was saying stuff in, when he was when he was campaigning. He said he was just saying anything that got the crowd to cheer. I mean, there, there is uh, that. Yes, you're right. I can't understand why they've hitched their wagon to him. And he's still the de facto leader of the GOP right now. He's making That's the calls the GOP. From, his, from his golf course. Yep. And yep. and the reality is like, I mean, he doesn't even represent their values. Look, from a purely pragmatic place, I just hope they can get rid of him. And we can go back to having debates about like points of view that make sense. Right now, we're far from that. We're debating reality. Like that's that the what the what happened in this whole ex experience is we're we are now instead of debating points of view or policy we're debating what's real and until we get to the point where we have a shared reality we have no hope. That's my wife will tell you I hate when people say like what my reality is X Y Z like. That might have stood in like the 50s, but there's a thing called the internet and Google and like, let's say you live in a town and there's not a lot of black or brown people around and all you think is all black and brown people rob and steal and cheat. Like you can Google the statistics from every major university, from every major federal government study, every nonprofit, like ignorance is no longer an excuse. And we spent the last four years arguing about, you know, Trump's outright lies as if they were like, some other kind of truth and there it, none of everything he said was a flat like the amount of lies i mean there are, you know there are nonprofits that tracked all his lies throughout his presidency but like the amount of lies and time spent on debunking and debating i mean yeah I, I, we're literally debating whether or not the earth is flat right now and it's like can right. we, we can we get back to like you know, what programs are actually positive for poor people or, you know, fiscal conservatism right, right. versus, you know, more welfare or whatever. Like, I just long for those days and we're a long ways off. But, well, I'm. thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I would actually love to have you back on the show at some point in the not too distant future. And, and I'll personally volunteer us to be on your show if you'd like. Um, I think the only sure. thing we can really do right now is talk about this. And I want to talk more. So we should do it. No, um, I really love you guys' show, and um, I like that you, you're willing to talk about topics that some podcasts just don't. Everything is like pop culture or like feel-good stuff. You've got to have, I think, you know, strong mental fortitude to talk about tougher topics, especially— oh, we took We took two months yeah. off. We were basically off in, de in November and, and December because, like, by the time the election hit, I was just mentally overwhelmed. And, and on our first show back, I was like, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Yeah, my other show, the crossover show, um, I recorded my last, I did nine episodes and I stopped, I think in October, because I was doing some heavy topics and it was just like, it's just so much going on. Yeah. Um, time has flown by. And some days I say, like, I don't know how my grandparents lived in a society like this in the fort, you know, my grandparents were born in the late 30s. Life was a lot tougher for them than it is for me. And I don't, you know, I get a little bit of what they had to experience. And I don't, I don't see how. I just don't see how you can do it every day. Yeah. So, well, let's stay strong. 
We really appreciate you. Yeah, thank I you. really appreciate you. We love having you on so much, and thanks for for being here. We'll put some links into everything that we did talk about as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, but. no, I've got a, I got a, I took a list. Excellent. <laughs> because you know, <laughs> uh, thanks for listening. If you have ideas, feedback, thoughts, please find us on social media. We are Bicurian on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can give us a call at three zero three. Five seven eight nine one five five. You'll probably leave a message. And podcast, you can email us at, at podcast at com. And if you like what we're doing, please rate us on your listening platform of choice. Thank you. Thank you.